Weird Tales, Strange Life of H.P. Lovecraft. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. Most horror traditionally has been essentially a, a ghost train ride. You climb onto the ghost train, you head off into the darkness where the horror is waiting, and at the end of the story you bounce out back into the daylight, the monsters are defeated, things were hard, but you're okay. Lovecraft doesn't offer that. You don't get off the ghost train. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little. But someday the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality, and our own frightful position therein, that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. He goes one step farther than a lot of other fantasy writing. He does not merely say that there are strange and terrible things out there, but this is in fact the structure of the universe. H.P. Lovecraft never had a book published commercially in his lifetime. He placed his short stories almost exclusively, if that's the right word, in luridly covered pulp horror and fantasy magazines of the 1920s and 30s. In particular, the first and most famous magazine devoted to fantastic fiction, Weird Tales. He died in near poverty and was once contemptuously dismissed by the critic Edmund Wilson as a hack. And yet, since his early death in 1937, something remarkable has happened. Slowly but surely, the posthumous collections became bestsellers, championed by the likes of Stephen King, who has hailed him as the most important exponent of weird fiction since Edgar Allan Poe. Lovecraft has been reprinted by Penguin Classics and recently received the supreme accolade, publication by the prestigious Library of America, where the volume called Tales stands alongside such giants of high American literature as Hawthorne, Melville and Henry James and, of course, Poe. Like many readers, I first encountered Lovecraft in early adolescence. His tales of the dark side wreaked a highly satisfying revenge on a grown-up world that looked by turns boring and frightening, and his emphasis on mysterious secret lore and forbidden knowledge gave his work a kind of underground cachet. Returning to his work after many years, I thought I might find only a maker of boys' toys, essentially an old adolescent writing for adolescents. Yet something about his obsessive vision stayed with me. And the tales, to my surprise, were well written, in a style which, though it has had many followers and parodists, remains Lovecraft's alone. As a stylist, he is remarkably easy and remarkably pleasant, I have to say, to parody. The British fantasy writer Neil Gaiman is among many contemporary writers inspired by Lovecraft and his language. It's very easy to start listing your favourite Lovecraftian words. Mine are definitely eldritch. It had been an eldritch thing. There are word ticks that he uses. There's this sort of strange clotted adjectival froth that will sit on the top of a story. So little is known of what went on beneath the surface. So little yet such a ghastly festering as it bubbles up putrescently in occasional ghoulish glimpses. Gibbous. Things keep happening under gibbous moons. Gibbous actually just means the moon is nearly full. The trachean. There's a good Lovecraftian word for you, and it actually means frog-like. And inside that rusted iron straitjacket lurked gibbering hideousness, perversion, and diabolism. Here, truly was the apotheosis of the unnameable. My favorite thing about Lovecraft is the lengths that he goes to explain to you that he cannot tell you how bad something is. Kelly Link is one of the most important new writers in American fiction. Her work crosses boundaries between science fiction, horror, and mainstream. The fact that he brings you up to the threshold or the brink and then stops is infinitely scarier than horror that sort of shows you everything. You know you're in a Lovecraft story within a sentence. He parodies 
terribly easily. But I think you can only parody really easily if you are a genuine stylist and if you are unique. Howard Phillips Lovecraft was born in 1890 in Providence, Rhode Island, where the architecture of the colonial period was matched by his family's Anglophile nostalgia for pre-revolutionary America. From the beginning, horrors in his home life helped shape his shadowy vocation. The Lovecraft editor and the biographer, S.T. Joshi. We don't know a great deal about his father. It appears he grew up in the area of Rochester, New York. Eventually, he became what is called a commercial traveler. At some point, he was in Chicago on a business trip and apparently, uh, basically, <laughs> went insane. Had a nervous breakdown, was brought back and spent the rest of his life up till the summer of 1898 in Butler Hospital, which is a mental hospital in Providence. We now know or suspect that he had syphilis. Must have been a very traumatic experience for Lovecraft. Did Lovecraft ever visit his father when he was hospitalized? Lovecraft himself claimed that he never did so. In fact, Lovecraft apparently believed that his father was paralyzed or otherwise incapacitated. And I believe that his family told him this as an excuse not to visit him in the hospital. So with the, the death of the father, the grandfather becomes a crucial figure. What kind of impact did he have on Lovecraft's early life? Grandfather Whipple Van Buren Phillips was a very successful businessman in Providence. He made and lost several fortunes, but he also took considerable interest in his grandson. He told him oral weird tales. It was probably a combination of Grandfather Whipple's tales and his grandmother's death which brought forth the first monsters in the infant Lovecraft's imagination. I began to have nightmares of the most hideous description, peopled with things which I called night gaunts, a compound word of my own coinage. In dreams, they were wont to whirl me through space at a sickening rate of speed, the while fretting and impelling me with their detestable tridents. It is fully fifteen years, aye more, since I have seen a night gaunt. But even now, when half asleep and drifting vaguely along over a sea of childhood thoughts, I feel a thrill of fear and instinctively struggle to keep awake. That was my own prayer back in 96, to keep awake and ward off the night gaunts. The night gaunts may have spooked Lovecraft, but they also prefigured his habit in later life of drawing on the content of his most vivid dreams for transmutation into weird tales, like a pulp Coleridge or Thomas de Quincey. His imagination was also fired by the books that abounded in the rambling first house in Angel Street, shared with his grandfather and his mother. These included at least one first edition of Cotton Mather, a figure from the dark American past of witch trials and demonic possession. Of more interest to the infant author, who began writing in verse at the age of six, were the 18th century translations of Homer and Ovid. Lovecraft continued to show signs of astonishing precocity. At the age of eight, threatened with compulsory enrollment in dancing class, he promptly responded, Nemo ferre saltat sobrius nisi forti insanit, a quotation from Cicero to the effect that no sober person dances unless he be insane. It's one of the many ironies of Lovecraft's life that his papers and manuscripts are now housed in the John Hay Library at Brown University. Brown was a model for Miskatonic University, the imaginary institution that recurs in the stories, and where Lovecraft mischievously deposits a copy of his invented book of ancient evil, the Necronomicon, to be consulted at your peril. Because his nervous disposition so often kept him at home, Lovecraft never graduated from high school, so his dreams of studying at Brown, or anywhere, were dashed. Nevertheless, his papers, letters, and back numbers of weird tales are now all lovingly preserved at the library, where I met with the collection's curator, Rosemary Cullen, in a room strewn with Lovecraftiana, including signs of the child prodigy. The vocabulary is astounding for a child of his age. Little Glass Bottles was written in about 1896. So here we have a six-year-old boy who already knows how to get the attention of his readers right from the opening sentence. Heave to, there's something floating to the leeward. 
The speaker was a short, stockily built man whose name was William Jones. They show an excellent handwriting for a six-year-old, and one of the extraordinary things is that he saved all of these efforts. They didn't get lost somewhere along the line. When Lovecraft's beloved grandfather Whipple died, his death hastened by the failure of his business, the family slid into genteel poverty. Lovecraft and his mother Susie were forced to move to a far more modest house along Angel Street. For the fragile youth, it was all too much. Lovecraft had developed a great sense of place. All his memories, all his fondness in life had been wrapped around that rambling old house at 454 Angel Street. In many ways, he never recovered. He even claimed that for a short time he considered suicide. He would take long, solitary bicycle rides throughout the city and go to the river and wonder if he'd just plunge himself into the river and drown peacefully. And it's interesting, what dissuaded him from that was intellectual curiosity. As I contemplated an exit without further knowledge, I became conscious of what I didn't know. Tantalizing gaps existed everywhere. What of the vast gulfs of space outside all familiar lands? Desert reaches hinted of by Sir John Mandeville and Marco Polo. Tartary, Tibet. What of unknown Africa? The story of Lovecraft's moves within Providence is the story of a paradise lost. The original, the first house with its servants, its, its splendor was gone. And now we're at 598 Angel Street, much smaller quarters. Clapboard, well kept, but at the time a real come down for Lovecraft. And he and his mother Susie, who lived here for around 15 years, occupied only the western aspect, about four or five rooms. They represented to him the, uh, the stark realization that he was no longer of upper class or of a rich family, which uh, he had been led to believe all those years. Mark Michaud, whose publishing house, Necronomicon Press, is one of several independent presses dedicated to Lovecraft. The harsh reality of fending for yourself with a mother who quite possibly had been showing signs of insanity already when you know first moving here, it was quite a shock to him. It's tragic, isn't it, that both parents died insane? I'm not a doctor, but it would not be a far stretch to say that she may have suffered from syphilis also because that would explain the insanity in both of them. I mean, we don't even know how often Lovecraft would have gone to visit her when she landed in Butler finally. Uh, we get the impression not very often, even though it would just be a walk down the road. We also have to remember that his mother made the shocking statement to a friend that uh, Lovecraft had a hideous face and that he never wanted to be seen by anybody because of his bad looks. How would you describe him? What did Lovecraft look like? Gaunt features looked like he had a slight case of what is called the Marie disease, where you get the long jaw, you know, you would notice him on the street. During this five-year period after his so-called nervous breakdown of 1908, he really did seem deliberately to avoid people's company. There are reports that he would walk along the street in a raincoat, uh, looking straight ahead and with the collar turned up uh, so that nobody could see him. We're now outside a most curious brick and sandstone building, late Victorian, with a splendid dome, the Ladd Observatory. Yes, uh, Lovecraft had the uh, privilege of being able to come here on a regular basis, was allowed to actually use the telescope here when he would have been probably about 15 or 16 years old. It's clear that as an adolescent, Lovecraft was enraptured by the stars, but eventually there, there must have been some of that astral coldness got into his soul. It certainly gets into his writing. The more he studied astronomy as life went on, he realized and often said how we were but little specks in the universe. That really showed in his stories how unimportant the human being was in the vast picture of things. This sense of cosmic insignificance, this inverted awe, is central to the workings of the classic Lovecraft story. Lovecraft was able to escape loneliness by means of a remarkable institution of the period, the amateur journalism movement. I think the world of amateur journalism, in which he very quickly became a power, helped save his life the leading American horror writer, Peter Straub. In those days, the early part of the 20th century, from uh, the teens probably through the 30s, men and women in their homes made magazines. They published their editorials and their essays themselves, and they took it as a serious matter. 
we don't have amateur journalism anymore, I guess, unless you count blogs. H.P. Lovecraft finally found a place where he was accepted, and not only accepted, but admired, because he was made president of his amateur press association within two years of his joining it. People valued him. It uh, must have been immensely confirming. Lovecraft's productivity as an amateur journalist was astonishing. It put him at the hub of a network of outsiders with whom he communicated, usually by post, and at length. After his mother's nervous breakdown and her eventual death from a botched gallbladder operation, such networks provided a lifeline and a legitimation for the formerly reclusive Lovecraft. In his mid-thirties, the confirmed bachelor astonished everyone by getting married to another amateur journalist, Sonia Haft-Green, a widowed Russian Jew seven years his senior. He moved to her apartment in Brooklyn, where, as manager of a successful hat shop on Fifth Avenue, she was able to pay the bills while he eked out a bare living selling stories to the pulps and ghostwriting for clients who included the escapologist Harry Houdini. Ever in search of what he called adventures in antiquity, Lovecraft was married in St. Paul's Chapel in Lower Manhattan. In so doing, he had chosen the oldest extant colonial building to remain in New York City. In the chapel, whose graveyard now leads directly and poignantly down to ground zero, I met the critic and horror writer, Peter Cannon. His letters from this period are filled with descriptions of tours of Manhattan and Brooklyn and cities in New Jersey and out in Long Island that had uh, remains of the 18th century. Uh, America, much as it is a new country, there were still in New York City a few survivals of that older time that he looked back to with such nostalgia and fondness. And, and St. Paul's Chapel, which I believe was built in the late 18th century, George Washington worshipped there, was just such a vestige of uh, this old aristocratic English way of life that he so admired and, and tried to emulate in his own life as a gentleman. And so the chapel may have been one of the few positive ways in which he could have a good New York, he could connect with the city. Even though he was a materialist, he believed very much in tradition, and getting married in the Episcopal Church suited him. Right after they were married, they went off on their honeymoon to, to Philadelphia and spent most of the honeymoon trying to resurrect a manuscript of a story that Lovecraft had lost in the train station. And as his wife, Sonia, said during the honeymoon with all that work on the manuscript, they had very little time to honeymoon. Lovecraft's foreshortened honeymoon did not augur well for his marriage. But this had hardly been a courtship along the usual lines. Sonia would later state, loyally, that Howard had been an adequately excellent lover, but she was invariably the one to initiate sexual contact. After their first kiss, he actually blushed and admitted that this was his first kiss since childhood. And in a memoir written years later, Sonia wrote that he was never able to say the word love to her. When Sonia left her job to start her own business, Lovecraft's childhood experience of a fall from gentility to poverty seemed doomed to repeat itself. Lovecraft sought relief from the pressures of both marriage and job-seeking with the writers, all male, who became known as the K-Lump Club, named after their initials. He would sometimes spend all night leading them in nocturnal rambles, hunting out the increasingly rare antique buildings and hidden courtyards of modern New York. This is the Dutch Reformed Church in Flatbush, in Brooklyn. It's only a few blocks from where his future wife... The Lovecraft scholar and publisher, Derek Hussey. And in 1922, Lovecraft came to this church with his friend Reinhard Kleiner. And exploring in this old graveyard in back, Lovecraft was moved to chip away a piece of a tombstone here. And a week later, he wrote to his Aunt Lillian, from one of the crumbling gravestones, dated 1747, I chipped away a small piece to carry away. It lies before me as I write and ought to suggest some sort of a horror story. I must some night place it beneath my pillow as I sleep. Who can say what thing might not come out of the century to earth to exact vengeance for his desecrated tomb? And what was the story that Lovecraft wrote about this uh, experience? In fact, the story is called The Hound and it details the exploits of a man and his friend St. John, who was obviously intended to be Kleiner, who come to this graveyard and do in fact exhume a coffin from which they remove an amulet 
and the occupant of the grave hunts them down, kills St. John, and retrieves his amulet, and the Lovecraftian narrator comes back to the graveyard and digs again and finds the renovant back in his grave, covered in the blood of his friend, and bearing the amulet, which he had retrieved. The madness closes in. I can recall the scene in these final moments. The pale autumnal moon over the graves, casting long, horrible shadows. The grotesque trees drooping sullenly to meet the neglected grass and the crumbling slabs. The vast legions of strangely colossal bats that flew against the moon. The antique ivied church pointing a huge spectral finger at the livid sky. The phosphorescent insects that danced like death fires under the yews in a distant corner. The odors of mold, vegetation, and less explicable things that mingled feebly with the night wind from over the far swamps and seas. And worst of all, the faint, deep-toned baying of some gigantic hound, which we could neither see nor definitely place. We've just walked from the apartment block in Parkside in the Flatbush area of Brooklyn, where Lovecraft lived with his wife Sonia for around nine months in 1924. However, circumstances led Lovecraft to a move to 169 Clinton Street, a much less salubrious area. A house of early Victorian date with white classic woodwork and tall windows with panelled seats. So Lovecraft wrote in his diary for 1925. His fortunes were continually decreasing. He was unable to find steady work as a writer or even as a ghostwriter, revisionist. And at the end of 1924, he and his wife made the decision to part company, temporarily at least. Sonia out to Cincinnati, Ohio, and Lovecraft to more modest surroundings here on Clinton Street where the rent was $40 a month. This uh, neighborhood was going downhill. He was unaware that there were a lot of uh, immigrants and Syrians and different types of nationalities living around here, which he really was not too keen on. Red Hook is a maze of hybrid squalor near the ancient waterfront opposite Governor's Island. The population is a hopeless tangle and enigma. Syrian, Spanish, Italian, and Negro elements impinging on one another, and fragments of Scandinavian and American belts lying not far distant. It is a babble of sound and filth and sends out strange cries to answer the lapping of oily waves at its grimy piers and the monstrous organ litanies of the harbor whistles. Here, long ago, a brighter picture dwelt, with clear-eyed mariners on the lower streets and homes of taste and substance where the larger houses line the hill. From this tangle of material and spiritual putrescence, the blasphemies of an hundred dialects assail the sky. In the story, there's, there's a lot of emphasis on underground wharves, on secret ways of getting into the country. And so the divisions between land and water are somehow blurred or cosmically messed up. All kinds of horrible creatures seem to be making their way in. Yes, I think you could almost view it as a sort of a reverse Ellis Island, where Ellis Island is often seen as a shining beacon. Come one, come all, you're tired, you're huddled masses. That was appalling to Lovecraft. He didn't want any more tired and huddled masses. They were all around him. You know, he would like to send them all back out. The letters home to his Aunt Lillian are even more virulent and offensive than the bile lurking in stories like the horror at Red Hook and He. Though he married a Jew, Lovecraft could only tolerate the ethnically other when diluted by assimilation and advised Sonia of his preference for an Aryan majority in situations involving mixed company. Difference so prized in the culture of today, was not something he valued. Indeed, his literary monsters and nightmares articulate the deepest abhorrence of it. I think their predominant color was grayish green, though they had white bellies. They were mostly shiny and slippery, but the ridges of their backs were scaly. I look at the shadow over Innsmouth, in which these dreadful creatures from the sea, fish frogs as he calls them, end up mating with the local townspeople of a small New England town called Innsmouth and producing even worse hybrids. Their forms vaguely suggested the anthropoid, 
while their heads were the heads of fish with prodigious bulging eyes that never closed. At the sides of their necks were palpitating gills, and their long paws were webbed. I was somehow glad that they had no more than four limbs. Their croaking, baying voices, clearly used for articulate speech, held all the dark shades of expression which their staring faces lacked. It's hard to see this as anything other than Lovecraft's warning of miscegenation, of the mixing of races. Given all this, how far did his vocation as a horror writer allow him to transmute repulsion into something powerful and engaging? When you look at the things underneath the typical Lovecraft story, they're actually pretty disturbing. Kelly Link. There's a lot of negative feeling towards foreigners, strangers, um, with a lot of horror. When you look at the stuff underneath it, it's actually quite unpleasant, and it stems from a lot of different kinds of prejudice, and that's useful stuff to mine for horror, but I think some of the reasons why horror is appealing to people are not particularly settling reasons when you think about them. Even horror today, when I write stuff which sticks closer to traditional horror, if I, if I look at the stuff underneath it, it's not terribly pleasant. The marriage to Sonia inevitably ended. Lovecraft was desperate to get back to Providence, or at least to its atmosphere and architecture, not its population. As a letter to Aunt Lillian begging her to let him come home gives evidence, Lovecraft's alienated imagination worked like a neutron bomb, saving buildings but removing people. It may be taken as axiomatic that the people of a place matter absolutely nothing to me, except as components of a general landscape and scenery. My life lies not among people, but among scenes. My local affections are not personal, but topographical and architectural. I am always an outsider, but outsiders have their sentimental preferences for visual environment. I will be dogmatic only to the extent of saying that it is New England I must have, in some form or other. Providence is part of me. I am Providence. The key tales that go to make up what would in time be known by devotees and younger writers as the Cthulhu mythos were written following his return to Providence in the summer of 1926. Living with his aunts, first Lillian, then later Annie, Lovecraft was in the most creative period of his life. So now we've reached the holy grail of Lovecraft's career in the pulps. This is an issue of Weird Tales, subtitled The Unique Magazine, February 1928, and it contains the first printing of one of his most famous stories, The Call of Cthulhu. But that's not the story which is uh, illustrated on the cover. That's true. Unfortunately, none of Lovecraft's contributions to Weird Tales included a cover illustration of his work. His name does appear at the bottom, uh, saying that a Lovecraft contribution is there, but for some reason he never made it onto the cover. It's very symptomatic that that story was rejected when it was first submitted to Weird Tales. I think the editor, Farnsworth Rice, simply couldn't understand it. It was too advanced, too unusual, and so Lovecraft, about a year later, had to resubmit the story and accompanied it with a letter, one of the most fascinating letters he ever wrote, explaining what he was trying to do, emphasizing the fact that this story really incorporates his cosmic philosophy more concentratedly than anything he had done before. So what's really new about this story? Well, let us remember that Lovecraft was an atheist. He grew up as a Baptist, but by the age of 12, he declared himself a, a complete atheist. And so now, how does an atheist write stories about gods from outer space? Well, it becomes clear that these are not really gods. They are simply extraterrestrials who have come from the depths of space and by a series of accidents wound up in the human sphere. And they are regarded as gods and worshipped as gods by the human beings who hope to benefit from their eventual takeover of the Earth. But quite frankly, these entities have as little concern with human beings as we would for a colony of ants. And so this cosmic vision is something really new to literature. Turning the pages, there is an illustration at the head of the story, The Call of Cthulhu, and a little quote, the ring of worshippers moved in endless bacchanal between the ring of bodies and the ring of fire, and lots of uh, naked bodies undulating in a 
suggestive but rather badly drawn way. The story of the Call of Cthulhu has an extraordinary sweep all around the world. Poets and artists are dreaming the strange image of Cthulhu. It rises up in the collective unconscious. And one of those hot spots where it breaks out is in the mind of Wilcox, uh, a decadent providence artist. Also, the narrator of the Call of Cthulhu is going through the papers of his granduncle, George Gamel Angel, and he finds in a mysterious locked box a bas relief, a rough rectangle less than an inch thick and about five by six inches in area, obviously of modern origin. Its designs, however, were far from modern in atmosphere and suggestion. Above these apparent hieroglyphics was a figure was a of evidently, figure of pictorial, evidently intent. pictorial intent, its impressionistic execution. though its impressionistic execution forbade a very clear idea of its nature. It seemed to be a sort of monster, or symbol representing a monster, of a form which only a diseased fancy could conceive. If I say that my somewhat extravagant imagination yielded simultaneous pictures of an octopus, a dragon, and a human caricature, I shall not be unfaithful to the spirit of the thing. A pulpy, tentacled head surmounted a grotesque and scaly body with rudimentary wings, but it was the general outline of the whole which made it most shockingly frightful. Here at the John Hay Library, we have a doodle, let's say, of Cthulhu drawn by Lovecraft and sent to his friend Robert Barlow. And here you see the nasty tentacles, the nasty scaly body, and the rudimentary nasty wings. It's in profile, and it's clearly a representation of the text that has just been read to us. Up until the teens and the 20s, there is a certain sort of stock of essentially folkloric figures from which horror draws. And you have the vampire, and you have the werewolf, and you have the goblin, and you have the ghost. The British fantasy writer and editor of Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness, China Mieville. There's certain relatively stock figures. But with the First World War, everything changes. And these stock figures are simply no longer up to the job, because the whole point is... Everything is bleak and new. And you see in the monsters he creates things that have absolutely no cognates with what's gone before. In many cases, they're described as indescribable. Corpses and flies and octopuses. There's an explosion of tentacles in Lovecraft. Lovecraft is the high priest of the tentacle. And if you go into a, a, a bookshop now and you look in the horror section, every other monster has a tentacle. This was new in the 1920s. And that's why I think that what he's doing at a pulp level, this sudden newness of the monstrous, is absolutely part of the same cultural process that we see in the explosion of the avant-garde. The same social crisis that leads to Dada and this sense of the absolute breakdown of language, of every preconception at a kind of pulp level of culture is what you see in the explosion of the weird tales of Lovecraft. It's about rethinking from the ground up and saying we do not understand the universe that we thought made a kind of rational order. Lovecraft began to make confident use of real places as an anchor to his own fantastic fiction. He became adept at plumbing the colonial era, its history and architecture, to help make the unreal real to his readers. His engagement with Edgar Allan Poe also deepens at this stage. In The Shunned House, a story written in New York but set in Providence, a stroll along Benefit Street, known as the finest mile of colonial architecture in the United States, allowed Lovecraft to engage with his greatest predecessor. Poe generally stopped at the Mansion House in Benefit Street, and his favorite walk led northward along the same street to Mrs. Whitman's home and the neighboring hillside church of St. John's, whose hidden expanse of 18th century gravestones had to him a peculiar fascination. Now the irony is this. In this walk, so many times repeated, the world's master of the terrible and the bizarre was obliged to pass a particular house on the eastern side of the street, a dingy, antiquated structure perched on an abruptly rising side hill with a great unkempt yard dating from a time when the region was open country. It does not appear that he ever wrote or spoke of it, nor is there any evidence that he even noticed it. And yet that house to the two persons in possession of certain information, 
equals or outranks in horror the wildest fantasy of the genius who so often passed it unknowingly, and stands starkly leering as a symbol of all that is unutterably hideous. I think that there was a little rivalry between Lovecraft and his deceased uh, predecessor. The science fiction writer and Providence resident, Paul De Filippo. Lovecraft was not immune to that sense of trying to one-up uh, his literary predecessors. This is the house in Benefit Street, which gave Lovecraft the title for one of his most crucial transitional stories, The Shunned House. We think we're in gothic horror land. It starts with stories of werewolves and vampires, but ends with science fiction. The notion that current day structures could sit atop more ancient manifestations of cosmic phenomena, I think, is a classic Lovecraft motif. You dig down as deep as the Huguenots and, and there's more. You think you're at the basement, the metaphysical basement, but you're not. You need to dig even deeper. How important is it that the monster is destroyed, not with a stake through the heart, but uh, H2SO4, sulfuric acid? typical of the time, I think, is that writers had a sense that the old stake through the heart was no longer sufficient, that there had to be new methods. It, it turns out that the narrator in the, uh, the shunned house has really literally only scratched the surface. He sees a, a weird shape in the cellar, which, when he finally uncovers it, turns out to be the elbow of a really enormous monster. Suddenly, my spade struck something softer than earth. I shuddered and made a motion as if to climb out of the hole, which was not as deep as my neck. Then courage returned, and I scraped away more dirt in the light of the electric torch I had provided. The surface I uncovered was fishy and glassy, a kind of semi-putrid congealed jelly with suggestions of translucency. Still more I scraped, and then abruptly I leaped out of the hole and away from the filthy thing frantically unstopping and tilting the heavy carboys and precipitating their corrosive contents one after another down that charnel gulf and upon the unthinkable abnormality whose titan elbow I had seen. Welcome to the famous Salem Witch Museum. We are going to show you the witchcraft trials which took place in Salem Village in 1692. Do you believe in witches? Lovecraft's researches into the roots of horror took him inevitably to Salem, which today is crammed with museums, light shows, wax dolls, all commemorating the witch trials of 1692. Long after Christianity had come, it survived in secret. On the witches' Sabbath, the covens of thirteen would gather round their magic nine-foot circle, and the ancient ritual invoking the evil one would begin. In Lovecraft's stories, Salem is often transformed into its fictional analogue, Arkham, a pulsing nexus of sorcery and superstition. An enthusiast for the culture of wit associated with the 18th century, Lovecraft viewed the Puritan obsession with sin as coming from a benighted age. As a native of Rhode Island, which had been founded in repudiation of the repressions exhibited by the Puritans of neighbouring Massachusetts, Lovecraft speaks to an abiding, horrified fascination with the hysteria that broke out in 1692. At the Witch House in Salem, the period building used during the trials and the inspiration for Lovecraft's tale, Dreams in the Witch House, I met Bob Martin a Lovecraft scholar who has devotedly mapped out the real and the imaginary places of Lovecraft's New England. The protagonist of Dreams in the Witch House, Gilman, is pictured as stuck in the attic right at the top of the house, a place yes, of he's crazy in the, angles. he's in the garret. He's right under the roof. There are no straight walls beside him except for the gable end. He dreams a, a sequence of dreams, and some of them begin in a, in a rather gothic genre, but mm. by the end of the story, yes. we're into the fourth dimension. We're talking about things that seem to yes. dip in and out of space and time. What he took from science was a series of articles that ran all over the Western world about this scientist, an Englishman who had found a way to describe the fourth dimension and fourth dimensional space. And he said, well, it looked like balls of popcorn. And when you read Lovecraft's story, you'll find that the witch and her little uh, familiar Brown Jenkin lead Gilman out of his house and into the fourth dimension 
one of them looking like a uh, ball of popcorn, only Lovecraft's term is a congerie of bubbles. Two of the less irrelevantly moving things, a rather large congeries of iridescent prolately spheroidal bubbles and a very much smaller polyhedron of unknown colors and rapidly shifting surface angles, seemed to take notice of him and follow him about or float ahead as he changed position among the titan prisms, labyrinths, cube and plane clusters, and quasi-buildings. And all the while, the vague shrieking and roaring waxed louder and louder, as if approaching some monstrous climax of utterly unendurable intensity. This has to be one of the most emotive sights in American history. It's the room, in fact the bedroom, where Rebecca Nurse, old, sick, deaf, and completely innocent of any wrongdoing, was literally seized from her bed, dragged downstairs, taken to Salem, first arrested, then interrogated, and finally hanged for the crime of witchcraft. Rebecca Nurse was one of the central figures in the great drama, the great hysteria of the witch trials period of 1692. All roads for Lovecraft lead back to this place, because this is where America went wrong. This is where something toxic spread out. But it's an ambiguous darkness. It's still not solved, it's still not quite resolved what role hysteria, what role envy had to play in this unfolding drama of accusation and counter-accusation. And it leaves a, a dark cloud which festers in American history and American culture, in which darkness Lovecraft is able to draw the sustenance for the tales of, of the perverse, which he's weaving as a horror writer and a science fiction writer in the beginning of the 20th century. Back in Providence and living with his aunt, Lovecraft was writing work that was both forward-thinking and innovative, taking weird fiction into new science fictional realms. At the same time, he was also acutely sensitive to the Puritan past and to the origins of American horror. But he was also writing against the clock, he put off visits to the doctor, and his intestinal cancer, probably a result of the bad diet he always had, went undetected until it was too late to treat. He had changed a lot by this stage, even embracing a form of New Deal socialism. He came to favour the redistribution of wealth, though one based on the benevolent dictatorship of an intelligentsia. But there was precious little wealth to be distributed in his own direction. Lovecraft regarded his poverty as a kind of a game, at least that's what he says. It was almost as if it was like a contest to see how little he could spend on food and still manage to, to get by. I have to believe that part of the reason why he didn't go to a hospital till the very, very end uh, was that he simply couldn't afford to do so. Uh, he had no medical insurance, and they simply didn't have the funds for a long hospital stay. It, it is not clear what would have happened to him had he lived. They had simply run out of money. With a melancholy timeliness, his cancer killed him in 1937, just at the moment that his dwindling funds were themselves about to expire. It was his readers, many of them fellow writers and disciples, such as the founder of Arkham House Press, August Derleth, who kept the cult alive and Lovecraft in print. The strange world of his tales would extend a hospitable welcome to younger writers such as Robert Bloch, author of Psycho, and science fiction luminaries like Ray Bradbury. After posthumously selling millions of books, Lovecraft now has the accolade of being properly edited as a modern classic, there is some poignancy in the fact that someone from the demoniacal pulps should be canonized after his death. He was one of the greatest writers to, to emerge from the pulp magazines. In crime fiction, of course, there was Hammett and Chandler. He's the only writer of fantasy and horror to retain any sort of significance this long after his death. The real victory to me is that Edmund Wilson disparaged Lovecraft. He treated him with contempt and scorn. Lovecraft also proposed over and over again toward the end of his life that the United States publish uniform editions of its uh, most significant writers printed on Bible paper with sturdy bindings with satin strips. In other words, he foresaw the Library of America. H.P. Lovecraft is the Library of America, but Edmund Wilson is not. I think that's revenge. <laughs>
Weird Tales, The Strange Life of H.P. Lovecraft was presented by Jeff Ward. The reader was Jeff Harding. The producer was Paul Quinn and this feature was a Loftus production for BBC Radio 3.